in July of 2004, the city council in the town of Monza, the home of Italian Grand Prix Auto Racing, passed an ordinance banning the use of round or of curved fish bowls because they said that those bowls distorted the reality of the environment that was seen by the goldfish causing the fish to suffer and be in confusion needlessly. In 2005, Rome passed similar legislation without getting involved in a discussion on the rights of goldfish. There is a bigger question here. Maybe a bigger question for the goldfish, but certainly a bigger question for us. So what is reality? What's real? What is our perception of what is real? That's a subject that has caused debates and discussions among scientists and mathematicians and philosophers and theologians and people from all walks of life for many centuries. And as we come to Hebrews chapter 8, the writer of Hebrews addresses the same question. What is real? What is our perception of reality? Because what may appear to be real may just be a shadow. It may just be a picture, a cloudy picture, at best, of reality. Because the writer tells us that reality is found in Christ, and in Christ alone. Anything else is just a distortion of that reality, or it is an incomplete picture of that truth. So, the writer encourages his readers to get out of the fishbowl and get the right perspective. Embrace the reality. Embrace Christ. And he says, this is the point of this letter. He says in verse 1 of chapter 8, Now we have arrived at the main point. Kafalean. The principal thing. The the sum total of what the Holy Spirit has been bringing before us in this letter concerning Christ. What has been said. What we have been talking about for seven chapters. That it is Christ. Christ alone, who has brought us to God and who has brought God to us through his sacrifice, through the sacrifice of himself. Christ alone is our guarantee that we have been saved forever because only he is holy, only he is pure, Only he is unstained by sin, and so his sacrifice has been accepted by God the Father. Now, through Christ, the writer tells us, we can come confidently into the presence of God, and we can remain there forever. It is because of Christ that our lives have changed. We're not the same anymore. Nothing is the same in our lives. He is our great high priest. We're told in Hebrews 4.14, the one who lives, the one who intercedes for us, the one who has ascended into the heavens. The essence, the heart, Of the matter is this, he says, this is a fact that now we who belong to Christ have such 
a great high priest. One who is in the heavens. One who it says in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3, when he had made the purification for our sins, when he had purged us, when he had cleansed us, when he had removed the stain of our sin through his blood, sin which was an offense to God, when he had done all that, he rose from the dead and now has ascended back into heaven. Where he has, the writer says in verse 1, taken his seat. Casizo. Seated in glory. Seated in the heavens. His work's finished. His work is completed. He's accomplished our salvation. Unlike the priests on earth. They never sat down, did they? In fact, there was no place to sit in the tabernacle or in the holy place or in the holy of holies. It says in Hebrews 10, 11, they stood in the sanctuary day after day, continually offering sacrifices. But it says there that even with all the sacrifices, it never took away our sin. But Christ, by one sacrifice, sacrifice of himself, has put away our sin forever. He's dealt with it. He's done what needed to be done. It is a finished work, a final sacrifice. Yet even today, some people still want to try to add something to the work of Christ. They want to add something because they think it will please God and bring God's favor on them. There's nothing we can do to add to the value of the sacrifice of Christ. His sacrifice has absolutely paid for our sins. It is sufficient before God the Father. In fact, think of this. Anything that we attempt to do, to add to the work of Christ for our salvation is a filthy rag, but it is a filthy rag that dis- diminishes and devalues the glory of Christ. And God will not share his glory with anyone. So now, the writer of Hebrews tells us in verse 1, Christ has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. The right hand of the Father. Right hand of God. Place of honor. Place of, of glory. Place of power. A place of exaltation. That is the high priest whom we have. That is the one whom we serve. But, perhaps the writer of Hebrews as he was giving this picture of Christ in glory, perhaps the readers, it reminded the readers of the the council of the religious leaders in the nation of Israel as they sat in judgment, making decisions in religious and civil matters. Maybe they thought about them because as the judge sat there, there was a scribe sitting on either side of that judge, one on the left, one on the right. And it was the job of the scribes to record the decisions of the court. The scribe on the left would record all of the guilty verdicts. The scribe on the right would record all of the acquittals. Christ sits on the right hand of God the Father. In Christ, we have been found not guilty. We have been acquitted of our rebellion against God. As it says in Romans 8, 1, now there is no condemnation, no punishment for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are forever free from a guilty verdict against us. And the punishment that a holy God requires because of our guilt. So even now, 
It is Christ who is in the heavens pleading our case. Pleading our case before the throne of God. Claiming us as his own. As those that he has died for. That is our high priest. Whoever lives, it says in verse 2, as a minister. Le Turgos. As one who serves his people. Christ is a servant. A minister who cares for us. A minister, it says, who serves in the sanctuary, Ton Hagion, in the sacred place, the place set apart unto God. He serves in heaven. Unlike the Levitical priests on earth who served. They served in an earthly tabernacle. It says Christ ministers in the true tabernacle. Alethinos. Skene. He ministers in the real tent of heaven. Tabernacle on earth. The temple. The building. They were just pictures. They were just shadows. They were only temporary at best. In fact, they all crumbled. They all deteriorated over time. But Christ ministers in an eternal tabernacle. A heavenly tabernacle, it says, which the Lord pitched, not man. Pegel me. He's made it secure. Like he's driven tent pegs into the ground. Deep into the ground. So he can weather the storm. It's solid. It's sure. It is a tabernacle where the glory of God dwells forever. The place where we who know Christ will be forever. That is our hope. That is our security. We will be in the eternal tabernacle with Jesus Christ our Lord. What is visible now is just a shadow. It's not the reality. Shadow of things to come. We get so wrapped up and so preoccupied with these things here. We're chasing shadows. While what is unseen is the reality. And though we don't see him now, we are told that it is Christ who stands, who sits at the right hand of God, ministering on our behalf. For here, on this earth, it's not like that, the writer says in verse 3. Every high priest is appointed he He's got responsibilities in the sanctuary to minister. Responsibility to, to offer prospero, to present to God gifts, doron, um, sacrifices, praise, thanksgiving of dedication to God. We, you see those in the meal offerings that were, that were made. The high priest also made sacrifices. He offered sacrifice to Sia, animal sacrifices, that which was slain. He made these before God. That was his responsibility to offer sacrifices for his own sins, for the sins of the people. It's a picture, wasn't it? Of our Savior. A need for a Savior. That was the assignment of the Levitical priest. That's what they did. So the writer says, it is necessary. Arankaios, it's, it's right. It's logical. It is required that our high priest, this high priest, Jesus Christ, the one who ministers in heaven also have something to offer as a high priest. What did he offer? Well, we know he offered himself as a sacrifice. What does he offer now? He brings our praises. He brings our worship. He brings our thanksgiving to God for us. 
So he is a high priest. He works even now in heaven on our behalf. If he were here, the writer says, if he were here on this earth, he wouldn't be a high priest, would he? Why? Well, there are high priests here. They are the ones who offer gifts according to the law, according to the ceremonial law. And the ceremonial law specified they had to be of the tribe of Levi and the house of Aaron. But all of the high priests, all of those who were of the Levitical priesthood, they just didn't know, they didn't understand that what they performed, as they performed their duties in the temple, in the sanctuary, they didn't understand that they serve only a picture, it says in verse 5, a copy, a hupodigma, a sketch, an outline, something with no real substance. They didn't serve the reality. They served the picture. Something with new, no substance. It says like a shadow, a, a skia, like a silhouette of the heavenly things. It wasn't the reality. It was just a shadow. And a shadow has no worth, does it? In and of itself. Has no value. In fact, its entire existence is derived from the object, from the reality that it represents, that it reflects. Just as Moses was warned by God, the writer says in verse 5, crematizo, he was given exact specifications, specific instructions, detailed requirements when he was about to erect, to construct the tabernacle in the wilderness. See to it, it says, oreo, understand the importance of what you are doing. That's what God told Moses. You are to make all things, when you make this tabernacle, according to the tupos, according to the pattern, the model, the image which was shown you on the Mount of Sinai. For this tabernacle, this place of worship that you are to construct is to be a reflection of heavenly things, a shadow of those heavenly things, something that pictures God. Every aspect of the tabernacle, of the temple, pictured something of God, something of the salvation that we have through Christ, but it was still just a shadow. It was a picture of Christ, of his sacrifice. That is the reality. Christ is the reality. He has obtained, it says in verse 6, Tucano. He has hit the mark with a more excellent ministry, Diaphoros. His service, his priestly service in heaven surpasses the service of the Levitical priests on earth. It has more value. It has more worth by as much as or to the extent that he is also a mediator. Masites. He stands alone as he stands in the middle. As he stands between us and God. He brings us together. He represents both of us. He's the one, the only one, who can make peace with God for us through his blood. The high priest on earth couldn't do that. Only he can do that. The mediator, we are told, of a better kretan, a more excellent covenant. Diatheke. More excellent agreement. It's an agreement. But that word, diatheke, 
used for in agreements here, is a special kind of agreement. Normally, the word for agreement uh, in, in Greek, agreement between two people, is the word sunthetheke, like a, a marriage agreement. An agreement made between two people. Or a business agreement between two people. But this word, uh, diatheke, is an agreement that does not require two people. It's an agreement that only requires one person, like a will. That is the agreement that God has made. He has written it out. He's written out his covenant, his agreement, and he presents it to us. And there are no negotiations. There's no bargaining with God concerning his covenant. We either agree to the terms that he has laid out concerning our salvation in Christ, or we reject those terms and we face the eternal consequences for our rejection of him. But there is no discussion. It is his covenant with us. A binding agreement which remains unalterable since it is God who has dictated the terms of that agreement. And he has confirmed it through his word, through his oath, through his promises to us. But it is an agreement that is in our best interests because it says in verse 6 that this agreement has been enacted, nomo feteo, it has been made into law, it has been prescribed to us as the solution for our sin. A solution made on Better promises, he says, epe galia, on a promise of blessing. That's the kind of promise God gives us. That's the kind of covenant this is. God promises to forgive us through Christ. For if the first covenant, it says in verse 7, and what covenant was that? The covenant that was made with the children of Israel. Right? Now, he says, if that covenant had been faultless, amentos, if it was not lacking in some way, there would have been no occasion, no topos, no reason sought, no reason required, zateo, it wouldn't be required that there be a second covenant, would there? That makes sense. So what was the problem? What was the problem with the first covenant? Where was the breakdown? When God gave his law, when he gave his commandments to the people, what was their response? Exodus 24, 7 tells us. It says that Moses took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And we will be obedient. Well, there's the problem right there, isn't it? The problem isn't with the law. The problem was in their inability to keep that law. Which is our problem as well, isn't it? The law. The law of God. His commandments. His standards. Show us that we don't measure up to his standards. Shows us our need. But it certainly doesn't provide us with the solution, does it? So, it says in verse 8, finding fault with them. Memph. Memphomai, blaming the people, not the law, God spoke, even as far back as the prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament, 
And listen to what he said. Because it is the prophet Jeremiah who speaks, even then, of a new covenant. A covenant to be revealed in a future day. He spoke in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34, which the writer of Hebrews quotes here and says, Behold, Edu, pay attention to what I am about to say. Pay attention to my words, he says, because the days are coming, says the Lord, when I, according to my sovereign will, according to the power of my word, I will effect, suntelo, I will bring forth a new covenant. I will bring forth a new agreement. There will be a new relationship with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Kainos. It will be new. It will be unlike anything that you have ever seen before. It will not be a covenant like the one which I made with their fathers in the wilderness on the day when I took them by the hand like a loving parent who holds the hand of a child. And I I led them out of the land of Egypt through the wilderness, through the danger, through the difficulties. But they did not continue. In my covenant. They didn't follow my my ways. They didn't follow my word. They didn't keep my commandments. Instead, what did they do? They murmured against me. They rebelled against me. They were disobedient to my law. And because of their disobedience, because of their unfaithfulness to me, like a wife who is unfaithful to her husband, I did not care for them, the Lord says here in verse 9. Ameleo, I turned away from them. But the days are coming. And this is the covenant I will make with them, with the house of Israel, after those days of disobedience, after the time of their spiritual blindness. As it says in Zechariah 12.10, I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace, grace and supplication, longing so that they will look to me, look upon the one whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him, and they will weep. They will mourn as one mourns for an only son and weep as one weeps over the firstborn child, says the Lord. The day is coming that for those who will repent and come to me, trust in Jesus as their Messiah, as their Savior. Then, he says, I will put my laws in their minds to know the truth. I will write them, I will write my words upon their hearts, not upon tablets of stone. They will have a personal relationship with me, a personal relationship with God. Something that is available even today, to anyone who will come to Christ. And the Lord says in Jeremiah, and here in verse 10 of Hebrews, I will be their God, and they will be my people. 
living in fellowship with me, in the care of the God of the universe. And on that day, we're told in verse 11, when Christ rules and reigns upon this earth as the everlasting king, he says there, then I, I will teach them. They shall not teach everyone, his fellow citizens, his friends, his neighbors. They will not teach everyone, his brother, his family. Saying, know the Lord, Ginosko, recognize him for who he is. For all who come to me, the Lord says, shall know me. Different word, oida. They will have a personal knowledge of me in their heart. From the least, from the most insignificant person, even to the greatest, to the most important of them. It says in Isaiah 11, 9, the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That is God's promise. That is his covenant. A new covenant. He says, I will be merciful to them. Hileos, I will be compassionate in regard to their iniquities and their sins because of my son. My wrath will no longer remain on them. No longer will they be under my chastening. And I will remember their sins no more. Their sins will never be charged against them. Words from the prophet Jeremiah. Words that God spoke concerning his new covenant hundreds of years before Christ walked this earth. And when God said back then that a new covenant would be made, the writer tells us in verse 13, he has made the first covenant obsolete. Paleo. Even back then, it was out of date. It was invalid. And whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old, Gerasco is in decay. That is ready. Agus, it is near to becoming disapp- disappear. It'll be gone. So why? Why would you cling to something that's vanishing? Something that won't be here anymore. A shadow of the reality. The reality is found in Christ. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 26, Luke chapter 22, on the night that he was betrayed, the night before he would Suffer and die for us. Words that were repeated to the church in the city of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We are told that Jesus told us to remember. To remember him. To always keep this in our mind. Keep it in our heart. That his death is the fulfillment of the pictures and of the shadows that are found in the Old Testament because his death brings us into what? He said, into a new covenant, a new agreement, a new relationship, which he said is written in his blood. So get out of the fishbowl, the writer of Hebrews tells us. Get the right perspective. Get the true perspective. Embrace the reality. Embrace Christ, who alone is our great high priest, who is our light 
and our life and who is our salvation forever. Amen. You've been listening to Bruce David Bell, pastor of Borean Bible Fellowship. If the Lord has ministered to you through this message and you would like more information, then visit us on the web at bbfva.org.